From the up-and-coming actors to the veterans like myself, the Foundation is here to help all of us. As fellow artists, we've all been there. It's crucial that we remember where we came from and help out however we can. For over 25 years, the SAG Foundation has been the industry's best kept secret, and we're out to change that. As natural storytellers, it's great that we have the opportunity to give back through the children's literacy program. A disaster like Sandy really brings it home with how crucial the SAG Foundation is. Their donation drive helped so many people in need. The seminars and workshops are crucial. Working together is what makes us better. The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies solely on donations to keep these important programs free for everyone. The SAG Foundation can't do it alone. We need you. If you need help, ask. If you can help, give. We're all in this together. 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 Together, everyone benefits. Join the cause. Back now. A service organization. We were founded in 1975 and we're dedicated to building awareness, appreciation, and support for the performing arts in Greater LA. One of our uh, main legacy programs is the Ovation Awards, which hopefully you know about. We just had it this week, and there are a few O pins on some of our panelists representing their status as Ovation nominees and winners. Um, Let's dive in and, and hear a little bit from our panelists. Maybe we'll start at the end with you, Dakin, if you could introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about your path to becoming the artist you are today. My name is Dakin Matthews. Uh, I'm a Bay Area boy. I did uh, regional theater in the San Francisco Bay Area for about 20 years before coming down here. Uh, for about five years, I commuted between uh, LA and San Francisco, uh, doing both theater and film and television and then moved here in 1990 and I've been trying to work in all three media ever since and the last uh, five or six years I've been bi-coastal as well now with a lot of stage work uh, back east. And I'm, <coughs> pardon me, I'm Peggy Blow. Uh, wow, uh, musical theater. That's where I began years ago. Yeah, huh? Great way to start. Triple threat, sing, dance, act, the whole nine. Uh, grew up in the military, so we traveled around a lot, and I was always in somebody's ballet class or tap class and taking piano lessons and everything else my mother would point, point me at, and it paid off. Um, I've been doing musical theater ever since, uh, uh, even at my age, man. The last, the last uh, time I was kicking my leg up was uh, just about three years ago doing a full-out musical, and it was great. It's amazing. I can still do everything I did in my 20s, except now it hurts. <laughs> but I can still do it. Uh, crossing over uh, a lot of television, uh, guest starring in a lot of stuff. Uh, this last couple of seasons have been really especially nice. Um, uh, did uh, season finales for Castle, um, uh, Crash and Bernstein. I play Mrs. Lopez on that show, and that's kind of ongoing. And I've got a pilot coming out on Fox in February 2014 called Delirium, and I get to play the bad guy. And that's always fun. Um, got my SAG card years ago with a, and at a, for a film called Rabbit Test. I don't know if any of you remember that. It's a Joan Rivers production. Uh, that was like in 76. I was doing a variety show in uh, Vegas on my way westward uh, from New York. I uh, had lived in Brooklyn and done a lot of theater then. Uh, and stayed by coastal for a considerable amount of time until the work really started to happen out here, and then I decided it would probably be more economical to just live in Los Angeles. And so been here ever since. I'm Gigi Birmingham. I'm gonna, I'm blanking. I don't know who I am or what I've done. So I'll just, I'll just give you my elevator pitch. I, um, I'm appearing on Scandal this Thursday. I, um, I'm currently appearing in The Liar at Antius Company. I'm preparing to direct An Ideal Husband at Sierra Madre Playhouse. And um, for my work in master class at International City Theatre Long Beach, I just won the Ovation Award. Yes, you did. So, OK, I said yeah. something. Yeah. I, um, I'm, you know, my family were, were, slow, were slow starters, were slow to, to blossom. I, I can't believe I'm sitting up here, because I think it's a big mistake. Um, yeah. I will say that. Um, I went to college and then I went to New York. I was already 24. I lived in New York for eight years. 
I waitressed a lot and um, did a lot of non-equity theater. My big break was to uh, get my equity card doing um, uh, Shakespeare in the Park with a lot of movie stars. And then I moved to LA, because things just weren't really happening for me there. I moved to LA 20 years ago. And it's been very, very slow, but um, I now do work in television, and I do some films, and I do a lot, a lot, a lot of theater, sometimes for money and sometimes not for money. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, my name is Tony Mendela. Uh, what can I tell you? Uh, I grew up in the East. I guess probably by accident. I got involved literally by accident in acting, and I was fortunate enough to grow up in New Haven. So within walking distance, when I was touched and all of a sudden felt uh, a hunger for it, I had Long Wharf and Yale Rep as sort of reference points. So the earliest theater I saw was really sort of extraordinary theater, I thought. Uh, you know, finished school, thought I'd, I was an East Coast kid, never imagined I'd live in the West Coast, and uh, moved to New York uh, and got hired to, to go to Ashland. And from Ashland, uh, it was a six-month gig. You know, my friends were unemployed in New York. You get a choice, do you wait in New York or work in Ashland? And I was, it was so wonderful to get that opportunity because you were doing what you were trained to do. How often For you... those who don't know about Ashland, you want to say... No, that? it's the Oregon Shakespearean Festival. It's a rep. You know, they do 12, 13 plays a year in three theaters. And, you know, if you're coming out of a uh, league school, a, a university training situation, you're trained to do the classics, and it's... So wonderful to actually have that <laughs> opportunity fresh out of school. And from that, uh, I mean, so many things uh, came from that. Uh, you know, I then spent a year in Seattle and then 10 years in the Bay Area where I met Dakin and we worked together a bunch. He hired me a bunch. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then actually sort of followed him down here. He came down. So I came down actually sniffed around in the late 80s and really sort of came down in the early 90s as well. Uh, for a while I was going back and forth, and now I try to focus more on Los Angeles, o although I still do a fair amount of theater, you know, not as much as I used to. But. Great. So the theme of this series has been about balancing a life between the three different mediums, and we had casting directors and then directors, so I'd love to get your perspective specifically on what is it that you enjoy most that's distinct among the three, TV, film, and theater, and happy for anyone to, to dive in. Well, we'll start from this end, maybe. Great. Uh, I mean, the thing I love about the theater in the, is the fact that it takes you back 20, 2,500 years. It's a direct lineage of who we were and where we came from. That's number one. Number two, it's the only time we control the music of the performance. Uh, I remember having a wonderful uh, lunch with Dakin being puzzled by the business down here, and Dakin basically said, you know, that... He, the expectation of some, that something is going to be artistic in film and television is taken out of our hands. We're only one aspect of it. It then is, the rhythm of it is created by the, uh, by the producers and the directors and the editors. So that said, you do have to, I think as a, an actor in the 20th or 21st century, you have to come to some sort of peace with, with the media. Otherwise, I think you're kidding yourself. Now, you can choose not to participate. That's fine. But you can't sort of deny it. And the, and there's just one other thing I'll say, and then I'll move on. The thing I find interesting is the prejudice, because on both sides, you know, uh, theater actors will tell you there are no talented people in Los Angeles, and how could you go down there and do t f television and film? Producers and directors in television and film would tell you, why do you do theater? There's no money. There's no status. You know, and yet, I can, having come from a theatrical background, what always amazed me was then, you know, I'd listen to this, because I'd be a fly on the wall, and I had my foot in both... Uh, uh, areas, and then I'd say to my friend, I'd say, Jimmy, so, you know, what are your favorite performances? What are the performances that have touched you? And he'd, he'd give me all films. They'd never be theater performances, they'd be film performances. So, you know, I'd sort of call them out. So, um, so the potency of that is a, is a big, uh, big draw, and it drew me down here as well. So what are the aspects that you enjoy in, in each of the mediums? Well, I, I, like Tony, I think, and like many uh, actors of my generation, we trained for the stage. We, we trained as athletes, in a sense, for the long haul. And uh, we only feel that we're actually in control of our art and really using every muscle and bone in our body when we're working in theater. So that's what I love about it. Uh, and also, uh, the thing that you find is that the 
TV script or film script that offers you something really meaty comes along very rarely. And I, I know about uh, 22 years ago, I started an acting company in LA. And one of the reasons for that was that, that actors who had trained to do theater and had done theater like Tony and many of my friends who came from the Bay Area and some from New York were complaining about the fact that while even while they were working in television and film, they weren't getting the work out that they wanted. They, they weren't able to say great words and have great extended scenes that they were used to. So we started a theater that, whose premise was not that you should only do theater, because it respected the TV and film careers of people, but that you needed to stay in touch with your roots in theater. You needed to touch base in theater, because that's where you drew your original inspiration, probably, and your original training, and that's when you most felt like you were an artist. So that's what I like about it. Uh, I will be very frank. There are two reasons why I came to L.A. One was I have four children and needed to put them through college. And the money was promising down here. Um, I didn't come down until I was about 50 years old, so I was never going to be uh, a handsome young juvenile in, in Hollywood. I knew that. I looked 50 when I was 25, so no point in coming down and competing against real 50-year-olds. Um, but the other reason was that even in the regional theaters, which had been established for about 25 to 30 years when I started my film career, even in the regional theaters, some of their illustrious graduates who had left the theater for after three or four years, gone to Hollywood and made a career, were now coming back to those theaters and taking the roles that I'd prepared myself to play. <laughs> so even if I wanted to work well in regional theaters, I realized I would have to come to Hollywood and get a little TVQ, basically. So those are the two reasons I came down. Reasons I stayed was because the work in all media was quite rewarding, and uh, in both financially and artistically. But uh, that was why I came down. Uh, uh, what I enjoy about TV and film, mostly I enjoy, interesting enough, the sitcoms because it's most like theater. Mm -hmm. It's great to do great films with great directors and great actors, great to do one hour you know, TV things, but sitcoms, are, if they're well written, which is rare, are still <laughs> like being in theater. How so? Talk a little bit more about that. Well, because you rehearse them. You have a script. You have to do them all in a straight run on one night for certain. And you form, a, you know, everybody who's in the sitcom forms a kind of camaraderie, as you do when you're rehearsing and performing a play. It, it just feels a lot like... And there's an audience. And there's an audience, yeah. I'll, I'll dovetail on what Dignan was saying about um, the theater. Uh, it's the only place for me, except for class in my early years, where you just continually evolve as an artist. Um, just from one play to the next, the different genres, all, all the demands of, of theater performances require you to grow if you're going to um, you know, reach the peak of your abilities. I don't, I don't know if, if I, I suppose in television it can be the same thing, but there is a repetitiousness, I think, to the, the characters that most of us are asked to play. Also, I think most of us who do theater have a somewhat wider repertoire of roles and characters that we play, at least character men do. I don't know about uh, their actresses up here. And uh, film and television does tend to pigeonhole you as, a, as one persona, one sort of character that you play. I tried to avoid that my whole career so that many different casting directors know me as many different people, so they don't. Also, just on Tony's point, I actually, one of the reasons I do theater is because three years ago, I got to play on the Epidaurus Theater, which is 2,400 years old, standing on the same stage that actors had been on 24 centuries before. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Wondering where their next job was going to yeah. come from. <laughs> drachma? How many drachma? <laughs> Peggy? <coughs> Pardon me. Essentially, it's the same for me. I mean, with every, you know, we're, we're all of similar generation. Uh, you know, the, the path was a path. Uh, I made my piece early on uh, because you're, you're right, they can, uh, the, the, whole, the whole matter of satisfaction as an artist. Personally, I get greater satisfaction in theater, absolutely. Uh, something about riding the wave of that audience that is just magnificent uh, to, because they become an organism and, and it's just you and them. And it's, 
and it's something that you just don't capture in front of a camera. Now, that's not to say because the law, as you say, you know, there's a camaraderie that happens in television, and I adore sitcom. That's one of the most fun things in the world to do, and I was fortunate enough to come along uh, and begin my uh, television career in sitcom uh, at the tail end of Norman Lear. So that was like, I mean, it was like, uh, it was heaven. It was absolute heaven. Uh, the, the rehearsal process, uh, uh, getting, getting on the set, hearing the audience out front as you're sitting right behind the set, putting on, getting your makeup put on, getting your hair done. Uh, and then to actually be able to go out there and hit it. And then when you hit it, you have that theatrical feeling. There is that theatrical feeling with that audience there. And when you're working with other people, the timing factor, that's what makes it fun for me, is to know that you can trust who you're on that deck with, no matter whether you've worked with them or not. But after you've done those, even those few rehearsals in, in comparison to theater, you still pull off a performance that you can be proud of. Uh, I, I like that very much about uh, working uh, in front of a camera. And I'll be honest, the money, because television and film allows me to do theater. So television and film is kind of an addiction with me because you know I'm, I'm scrambling running for those gigs because I know that it'll help keep my roof over my head and pay my bills and I don't have to worry a whole lot about being able to just kind of lay back and enjoy my life in theater. Great. Going back to uh, training or really any, any time in your career, careers, have there been mentors who've made an impact? And if so, can you talk a little about a little bit about your relationship with uh, mentors, be they teachers or colleagues, peers, any? Anything? I'll talk about my teacher when I moved to LA, which was only 20 years ago. Um, so do the math. I wasn't a young girl, but um, I, I studied with John Len, who has since passed away, but he um, introduced me to um, something that he learned at the Actors Studio, the affective memory. And um, it was the first time that I, uh, was able to access um, emotionally areas that, that had been inaccessible. And I'd always felt um, stiff about my emotions. You know, facile, but emotionally stiff. I mean, that's not an actor. You, you think it is when you're, you know, young, but it's not. So um, he, uh, the effective memory technique and, and um, you know, doing emotional work was uh, life-changing for me. I didn't start till I was 25 years old. Uh, I never trained as an actor. I never intended to be an actor. I'm not quite sure how it happened. I was a teacher, actually. I was a university professor. And a colleague dared me to audition for a Shakespeare festival one summer. And I was a Shakespearean, a Shakespeare teacher. And I thought, well, this would be interesting. I'll learn about performing Shakespeare in the summers, and then I'll teach my classes year-round. And uh, at the age of 25, I auditioned for Falstaff and Henry IV Part One at a Shakespeare festival, and they hired me. So, well, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, after a while, I started, so I, so I did a number of festivals. But in those years, because I had had no training, everyone who walked on stage with me was a mentor, because everybody had trained more than I had, and, so, and especially the older actors I looked to and especially the directors who seemed to know. There was a, a, a young director who was teaching a community college named James Dunn, who saw my work and invited me not only to join his Shakespeare Festival, but also to work with him as a guest artist at his college. This was a college that was probably the best theater department in the Bay Area for 20 years, and regularly sent a stu student to Juilliard every year for 10 or 11 years. It was really, he was a great mentor for me. Donovan Marley was a great mentor for me because he ran a wonderful theater in Santa Maria, halfway between San Francisco and L.A., when there were no summer seasons in those two major cities. So all the actors from L.A. and San Francisco would converge on this junior college campus and do a seven-show repertory, you know? And he was a great mentor for me, I think. John Housen was a mentor uh, when I worked at Juilliard uh, for a while. But I just kept learning every actor that I worked with, in a sense, who was older than I was, and that was true for quite a while. Now I'm the old fart in the company, I guess. <laughs> so I hope they're learning from me. Became an, a kind of mentor for me. Uh, Dakin's a great mentor, actually, for me and many, many actors in LA. He does a lot of uh, Shakespeare workshops and 
uh, he, he founded the NTS company where I'm a member. He brought me into the NTS company. I know Dakin Matthews. Um, and also my teacher, Zena Jasper in New York. She, she was the first one to teach me about truth telling. And um, teachers, you know, teachers. Well, for me, it was a gentleman uh, that you may or may not know. He's passed away. His name is Cliff Rockmore. Uh, he, tremendous director. Very, very talented man. He got me so jazzed up. The very first musical I did in uh, L.A., I was in my 20s, had just gotten here. I mean, within days, I had this audition, and it was one of those all-day-long things. It was a very New York style. You know, you got cut from the dance section and all this stuff. Well, I lasted all the rounds. And at the end of the day, he says, um, welcome to the cast. And I was, I was just ecstatic. I was ecstatic. Great show. And he says, well, we're going to have daytime rehearsals. And I said, well, I have a job. He says, oh, I'm sorry, daytime rehearsal. I said, hang on just a minute. And I went to the phone, and I called my boss, and I quit. I quit. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to, but I knew. I just kind of followed my nose. Would I do that now? No, no. We don't quit, we don't quit the job now, no, no. But he, threw, throughout, throughout my time of knowing him, he loved telling that story. He was one. George C. Wolfe was another one. Uh, he, I, lar I learned a lot about emotional truth from George. And currently, uh, it would be Shirley Jo Finney. Um, I have worked with her through the years, and every time, uh, she just takes you to a whole brand new level. She lets you see a little something that you never saw before. Uh, she evolves along with you. So it's a, it's a joy and an honor to be in her stable. Uh, that's what we call it. Uh, and she hauls you out, you know, to do uh, a show every couple of, uh, a couple of times a year. And uh, generally, everything she touches turns to platinum, huh? Mm. <laughs> Got my old pen. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there just are a lot of uh, mentors. I, I, when I started, to, I didn't act until I was in college, and I literally walked into a, an audition. I happened to go to a college where it was four women to every man, and it was an audition for The Tempest. Uh, so I got hired. I mean, I got uh, cast, and, uh, um, and the teacher had just left the Yale Drama School. She had been retired. She was, a very, she was of the old school. Her name was Constance Welch. And she had been there for like 30 years. And Brewstein, Robert Brewstein came in. And there was, a, there was a different smell in the air at that time. It was late 60s, early 70s. And anyway, she, uh, because it was that period, she would have a, a political activist actor. So she'd say, uh, Tony, would you mind understudying uh, this role? Because uh, George is a bit crazy. Because he, he would disappear, literally. Dan Laurier, was at, he was older than I was, was a couple of years. And he was at the school. He was playing Caliban. But he was a football player. She said, would you mind understand, uh, understudying uh, Caliban because Dan... So she would work with me during her lunch hour. And she was this little bird of a woman. She'd sit with her sandwich and, and proceed to... And let me do this stuff in front of her. It was the first time I was ever speaking Shakespeare. So it was, it was the first play I ever did. It was sort of interesting. Uh, so you cut to that. There are many, many other teachers and you train. But then something very interesting happens. You know, you get to the Bay Area, I did 10, I had uh, a wonderful chance, Dakin directed me in a couple of things, and Dakin's unique, I found, as a director, because he, you'll get a lot of directors who will tell you how to do it, or tell you how, how it should be spoken, and you, but it's very different when you get a director who, who's a terrific actor. Then I find people have to pay attention in the room. So the notes that you, you feel might be a little intrusive by a director who, uh, you know, who, who's not an actor, I never ever felt that way. I felt like, oh, okay, well give me, give me the note, and believe me, I'll make it mine. If the note is right, I will make it mine. But, so you do that, and, and I only mention this because now, the first 10, 12 years of work was all, of, a lot of it was about the word, because they were great playwrights. There, there were Shakespeare, it was Chekhov, it was Ibsen, it was, uh, uh, you know, Odets, it was Mamet. I mean, there was, you know, language there, and I think the thing I had to deal with when I came to L.A., was not respect the word as much. These weren't the great plays of the century. And anyone would tell you that. It's not to say they're not well written occasionally. I'm not. But you, need, you needed to make them your own. You, you really needed, so consequently, you needed a little bit more behavior, a little bit more you know, psychological things that I, I felt maybe I didn't scratch as deep sometimes. Or occasionally I would. And I studied with a guy when I was down here. There was an, a wonderful actor named Ray Burke, who was, uh, again, a Bay Area ACT guy. And he, I, I got to meet him a couple of times when I was moving 
uh, moving down. He said, I'm studying with a guy, Milton Katsalas. You know, and Milton was sort of a, a wonderful teacher, sort of a crazy, a crazy man. He was a complete human being. There's a lot of, you know, he was, he was really a force. So he had a, he had a Saturday professional class. And, you know, you had just wonderful people in there, just terrific people. And, uh, you know, he sniffed me out pretty quickly, you know, about that, about, you know, getting beyond the word, about getting to the behavior, about, about not, because isn't theater so much about taking command? Isn't, I mean, the, the sense of the voice and the presence and being in control is a very, in film, I find it's just the opposite. They love you to get, to make a mistake. They love to see the human. They love to see the cracks more, I think. Uh, and so he, uh, that's what he, uh, he worked with me on, uh, was that. And it was very useful to me because, again, I was, I mean, when I first came down here, I was auditioning for the director. I actually thought, now in television, you have to know the director might, might have just entered the room five minutes before you. And he or she <laughs> doesn't necessarily have control. There was a terrific casting person, Ron Surma, who used to do all the stuff at Paramount, Star Treks and those things. And he was a great guy, he came in for several auditions, and he, he was just a warm, loving guy. And he, you prepared, and he respected that. You didn't get cast, he had you back in again. And I was doing an audition, and if you can imagine, Ron is reading with me, and, and Terrence is the, the power, and this is the director. So I'm sort of all here, and Ron is going, during the reading. <laughs> You're like, oh, you know, and, oh, I get it. You know, I mean, it was quite an education. So dealing with all those things, but primarily training-wise, it is, it is different. I mean, uh, uh, and yet it's the same. It's really sort of a, uh, it's a bit of a paradox, you know. Um, and I have great, great respect for it. I, I don't, you know, I mean, you, could you, if you're not careful, you get into a thing about, you know, the depth and the, and the range of theater actors. And then you, you imagine, then you think of, okay, True Grit, Ralph Richardson. Mm, not so much, you know, or you think, you, you know what I mean? So you, there's something to be said for people that just, that really um, just take it from where they are, at least as a starting point. You know, because I'm used to, I, I, I don't, like a lot of actors, I don't necessarily like the way I look, the way I sound, so I like to put a cover on. You know, and I always admire people who, who the first thing they do is just go, you know? I'm going to drill down into that a, a little bit, because we've heard in the earlier panels, both from casting directors and the directors, about mistakes they've seen theater actors coming in, auditioning for film and TV, or vice versa. And each of you have, has been successful across the mediums. What, and we've been talking a little bit about techniques and trainings. Have there been things that you've seen that you brought to the table that allowed you to traverse across those boundaries, things that you left behind uh, moving in film to TV from, from theater or vice versa, and how they've kind of influenced your career and allowed you to be successful across those, those borders? Well, I don't know how anybody else feels. I always learn everything when I audition. Mm -hmm. I learn everything. I get off book completely when I audition. I always have the script in my hand, but I always get absolutely off book. I also follow, uh, you know, Brian Cranston's advice. Don't go in there thinking you're going to get something. Go in there to give something. Hmm. Take it seriously. You are going to give the best performance of that two and a half pages of sides that anybody ever gave. You're going to give them a chance to see what can be done with that. I also believe that a stage actor unless they have no access to their internal life, and there are some who don't, can always <laughs> learn how to become a film actor. I don't think it works the other way. That's true. Mm -mm. That's I don't think it works the other way. That, that, that the, there are a set of skills that have to be maintained, a set of, um, of, of talents that you have to have for stage work, especially if you're not mic'd, you know, your voice. Yeah especially if it's a large theater, your carriage, the way you carry yourself, that, that, that you have to learn and you have to maintain. So it's, I think it's, um, it's easier for, for a stage actor to learn how to take it down for film than it is for a film actor to learn how to take it up for stage. Mm -hmm. So I would say take each audition. If, you, if you're, you're going to in, try, go in for TV and film stuff, I mean, this is true, obviously, for stage stuff, you have to give a kind of performance, but... Give it, you know, learn your stuff, go in there with confidence to give them something, 
and then really just find something in there that they probably won't see anybody else do. Don't be eccentric for the sake of eccentricities. What I mean by that is be so real that they'll sort of think the character walked into the room rather than you. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, I think I, people talk about overworking uh, material. I don't know what that means because until I'm absolutely comfortable with it backwards and forwards, I haven't worked it enough so that I can do it with an organic, you know, response. So, um, and I think that is actually, for television and film, I think that's a, maybe a little bit unusual. And um, when I book something, it is because uh, I think uh, I, I've prepared it to, I just, I know it, I know who I am. I, I make some strong choices. And, um, and I don't let myself be distracted in the, um, in the outer room. Oh, hi, how you doing? Is that, da, da, you know. <laughs> Oh, I just avoid people, and um, I always feel sorry for actors who I see are chitty chatting, and then they get called in, and I think, oh, what are you going to do in there now? Um, but well, I'm going to add one more thing: the person who's reading with you is probably not going to be a very good actor. Some of the some of the readers are very good. Sometimes the casting director, but treat them as if they're the best actor in the world. Share the scene with them. Give just you know throw the ball to them as then you hope they throw it back to you. Some of them won't, but just continue to work with that person as if they're the actor you're going to work with. Give them every every benefit. I think. I it's odd. I, I'm, thank you for bringing that up. I actually had an audition, uh, and I too I absolutely learned the lines, um, and I I started that early on, and that's when I started booking. Uh, the script becomes a prop to, prop in your hand if it if it's anything at all. Um, but that element of uh, not only just learning the lines, but making a choice and, and having the courage to stick with that choice, no matter who's in the room, no matter how they're looking at you, you know, let, be on stage and let them disappear. You know, let the, you know, in your mind, uh, let those lights go up so you can't see them if, that, if that's what you need. Uh, but treat it as a performance. Um, I, I treat my auditions as if I'm on the set and the cameras are there, and the crew is there, and the cameras are rolling. Um, it, it just, it, it, it makes the whole process smoother. It, it just does, and I think that comes with experience. Uh, it takes time to get there, uh, because it, at first, in the early days, it's, it's intimidating to walk in those rooms. And, and uh, I don't know, you know, I don't see it that much anymore now, because you know, you, you, you're on tape and whatnot, but, uh, when I was starting out here in L.A., man, you walk in a room and there was a panel of people. I mean, you know, producers and, you know, and occasionally, occasionally the network guys sitting in the back of the room. Uh, I think the very first time I went to network, I got so sick. I threw up. The very first time it was for NBC and it was a recurring role and I was a kid and I just really was shocked. They chose me. And it was like, Okay, now what you're gonna do? Now you've got to audition for the big wigs and it, they take you out of your element. They take you out of the casting director's office and now you're in a room like this and they've got the lights and you're on, a, you're on an element similar to this. And the people that are making the decision, that final, final decision, because this is a whole nother level of casting. These are a whole new group of people and the network is sitting in the back of the room watching your every move. And it's like before you go in the room, it's like, could you excuse me a minute? You know? <laughs> and once you get that, never ha it only happened once. It only happened once. But it was a very necessary happening. <laughs> because I think it's part of the initiation process in the television to throw up once before you go to network. <laughs> you know, there's, there's uh, so many things. I, I think, you know, I can uh, only agree with a lot of things that have been said. But it's your chance to act. It's your chance. You know, you need to think of it is that way because, you know, I've had friends who have been very, uh, you know, successful and they, and they almost resent auditioning. And I remember being around, I was sort of just hanging around and finally, they, oh, you, you, you still have to audition? And finally this friend said, well, I acted today. What did you do? You know what I mean? So you need to, you know, what are, you know, you were, you know, playing, uh, you know, sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. Uh, absolutely. Learn your lines. They call it a reading, it is not a reading, it is an acting. And there's a reason for it, because it's not that unusual that you will be working the next day. Mm -hmm. So they, they, don't, they don't have time. And that's why typecasting exists too, frankly. They, if the actor fails, at least the look is there, you know? 
<laughs> you know, that said, another thing that's, that's very important is, um, and this becomes very, very tricky, is you can't let them catch you acting. In other words, you can't have an on and off switch. There are clever little things, but you need to come in with the character a little bit because so much is, is decided in the first 15 seconds. So I, I'm not suggesting you dress as a military officer or you do, but you, you, the bearing, the, uh, you know, if you have, a, there's a lot of hinting that goes on. You know, I mean, I have one shirt that I wear for military things. It's just got some epaulets. I don't, you know, it's not matched with my pants. I don't wear, but it, you know, it, it reminds me too. That's, I mean, that's uh, very important. And it's, auditions are very peculiar. The, the thing, you know, you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, you study the script, you do all that stuff, you've read the entire script. And then I've had situations, right, where you don't get the whole script. They give you six pages, eight pages of the night before, they'll give you a synopsis. You know, and they just won't, you know, there's, they won't give you the script. I go in, I do the auditions, several times I've been hired, I then get the script, I read it, I would never have played the character that way. <laughs> you know, I mean, so it's, it's a strange sort of thing, but I guess the only advice is to use it as an acting for yourself. And if you feel that way about it, then you will feel like you have something to give, as opposed to having a chip on your shoulder, like, you know, or, you know these stupid, dumb people who have all the power in their writing. And uh, no, they, they want you to solve their problem. You know, one thing you said, this, it, uh, Peggy, is very, very true, and it's a very sad thing. When, when I first came into town, late 80s or early 90s, you, you would, when you auditioned, you, everyone was there. You know, like you're saying, and now, you know, hardly ever is there a producer or a director room, it's on tape, and now even the casting people, it's the assistant who's doing it, and the only reason I say that is the notion it's of the casting person watching your, uh, um, your commitment, your seriousness, your preparation, all of those things, so he or she will then say, okay, you know, finally, they, they want to just get rid of you, we have to hire this gal. You know, she's worked so hard, you know, and, you know, you have someone in your corner. And I feel that's being lost. It's getting almost anonymous now. And uh, it's very sad. So we've talk, been talking a lot about process and what happens in the room. I want to kind of go outside of the room and maybe the work in it versus the work. And if you can talk about the business of, of you being able to balance across mediums, maybe talk a little about managers, agents, the business side of it, maybe any advice you've got for folks who are coming up through the ranks now. Well, I was very fortunate when I came down. I, I only had one agent pretty much all my life, and she loved theater. So she never resented uh, any theater that I did, always felt it was, uh, it was good for me and good for my career. I'm not sure she's right about that anymore, but... Um, so if you're going to, uh, if you want to continue to work in all media, find an agent or a manager who respects theater. That's very important. So for yourself, you have to say to yourself that I want to do theater and I will do theater and occasionally I will take a hit for that. That you don't say, well, uh, I, I'm, don't turn down every theater that comes along on the off chance that you might get something. Every year, make at least a commitment to one play, if you can. But I think even more important in this town, if you, are, if you love theater and have trained in theater and you want to stay doing theater, find a company to work with so that you don't always have to go even auditioning for theater pieces. You'll be doing that enough in film and television. Find a company that does the kind of plays and respects the kind of theater and your career and be, a, be a, an active, creative member of that company so that when you want to do theater or are free to do theater, there is a home to which you can go. And even if you can't do full plays, just reading Shaw once a week, reading Odette's once a week, reading Sheridan, doing a two-week workshop or a two-day workshop of a great play, anything to maintain your touch with theater even when you can't do a full-fledged production. Find a company, find like-minded people who will gather together not just to bitch about the audition that they didn't hit, but will actually speak positively about their acting experiences in theater and the projects in theater, whether they're full productions or readings or workshops that they are currently working on with you. I think that's a, that's a godsend for any actor that wants to stay active in theater. And you will also make connections with people who are active in professional theater and from that, jobs may also come. 
both in theater and in film and television. But don't try to do it alone, because theater is not an alone profession. Theater is a, is a communal uh, expression of art and join a community. I couldn't agree more. Um, you, you know, I've worked at many theaters in LA, and, and one of them in particular is my, my main family home, but it's a family. It's, it's your, you have a hundred friends, members who are your friends, and it's a, it's a tremendous supportive community. And, you know, when I go there, we, we don't talk that much about um, our television and film stuff. We're really there because we just love uh, the drama and we want to put it on and we want to study it and we want to evolve as actors. And uh, I, just, I can't speak highly enough to finding a, a family to join it because otherwise it's a very lonely profession. I mean, particularly if you don't do theater, it's extremely lonely. Where do you go for family? But if you do, if you do want to do theater as well, there's no reason on earth you shouldn't find um, a theater home. At my theater home, I started a career goals group and we theoretically we meet once a week. Often we don't meet because everybody's busy or auditioning or whatever. But they when we can, have careers. They have, we have <laughs> careers. But when we can, we meet and um, for networking, for support, for information. We share information. Oh, I saw that casting director last week. No, no, no. She doesn't like that. She likes this. I mean, it's informationally really uh, you know valuable. Uh, and the support is valuable, and encouragement, and running stuff by other people, and also just having somebody there going, well, you know, you say you want to do blah, 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 but I don't see you doing it. You know, it's, it's, it's invaluable. Can you talk a little bit about managers or agents in that process? We heard a little bit from Dakin. I'd love your, your take as well. The business side, outside of theater. Yeah. Um, I personally ha ha got a theater, a theater agent for the first time um, less than a year ago and uh, managed to book theater gigs without an agent. Um, it's wonderful to have somebody representing you for theater, but you can actually have a theater career without an agent, incredibly. Maybe not a brilliant career, but you can have a career. Um, my other agents are a, a different agency for television and film and commercial. And um, what, can, what am I to say about it? I'm thinking now a lot of actors, I'm, I'm guessing, but maybe you know more than I do, something has changed in the last 10 years that actors who want to work in theater and whose TV and film jobs are few and far between are now supplementing their careers a lot with books on tape, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is not a bad idea. You get to act, God yeah. knows. If you read a book, if it's a novel, you well. get to act. And uh, it pays fairly well. You know, you can... You can pretty much support yourself in the downtime, and it's a really good skill to develop, I would say. So, um, and it doesn't have much to do with, I know video games has the same sort of thing, but it's not quite as rewarding in terms of acting. Uh, but I think that's happening. You do have to multitask if you, if you are like a mid-level TV film actor and occasional theater actor. You do have to find sources of income where you can, and video games and, and books on tape are now offering uh, those sort of sources of income which don't ask you to wait tables, but you can still use your uh, talent and your skills. I, I will just say about my agents that um, my television film agents do respect that I'm a theater actor and I have to, I have to do theater. And um, that's, uh, you know, I, it's, like, it's almost like having two professions yeah. when you have two different agencies. Um, but they, they respect each other and they understand that I, you know, I book out with one and I book out with the other, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, they, um, uh, I mean, most agents, I mean, I, uh, most agents will tell you they, they respect theater. But there's obviously a prejudice towards New York theater or working at the Taper or the Geffen. You know, then they're, they're all in. But I think it's the other jobs that get to be a little tricker, uh, tr uh, trickier when you're out of town. Um, you know, I, I came to town, I was lucky. I, I, I found an agent, uh, you know, f fairly quick quickly within two or three months. And it was, a, at that time, was a mid-level agent who was willing to be patient with me and would send me out, you know, in, in meetings uh, occasionally. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I stayed with him for about 15 years until he went out of the, uh, the business. So obviously my career <laughs> didn't save him. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, it's funny. I mean, I don't know. It's a tricky thing. I mean, you need to have a good relationship with your agent. And you. This is something I, I would, I am not a good schmoozer. 
I am not, uh, I, my classic story about this, about a relationship, is, is an actor who you all know, Joey Pants. Joey Pantoliano, who was on The Sopranos, he was in a, Joey gave his, I, he told me he gave his agent a gift for Christmas, a really wonderful mug. And on the mug was printed, what have you done for Joey Pants today? <laughs> And now most people, the agent, you know, would say, well, get this guy out. But he, he has such charm. And I have always envy that because I do think that is part of the thing. And I, 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 always, I try to almost uh, go out of my way to, um, to at least have a, 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 a conversation with a producer or a director. Because my tendency is to go in and do my work and let my work speak for itself. There's a little bit of pride in that, too, frankly. It is social, so you need to sort of reach out. Not too much, but enough. Another thing in terms of, because you're talking about administration now. Yeah, sort of navigating the navigating, business terrain. Uh, what, there's a whole thing about, you know, there's a career, there's talent, and, uh, and there's administration. Administration to me is doing the things you don't want to do. So when you have an audition and you feel like it went well, you send a letter to that, uh, to that casting person. It's very nice to meet you. I'm sorry it didn't work out this time. You know, you just, you drop a note. And, and it, and for a while, I was doing a thing where um, I wouldn't allow myself to continue with the day until I had done the business thing I didn't want to do. Write the letter, make a call, do all those things. And sometimes they pay off. I had done, um, uh, I, did, I was in The Mask of Zorro, and then I was doing some other uh, uh, films for the uh, sci-fi channels, and I was in Bulgaria. And I read that Martin uh, Campbell was doing The Legend of Zorro. So I thought, so what the hell? I write him a note and I say, you know, Martin, uh, you know, it's been seven years and I've been busy, I've been doing this, this, and this, but right now I'm freezing my ass off in Bulgaria and you're shooting in Mexico, I need some warmth, please. You know, and I said, if there's anything for me, let me know. So I didn't hear for a couple of months and then finally my agent called and said, you got a script, they're going to send you a script, Martin wants to use you. And it was a completely different character. I justified that it was my brother because, you know, one brother is the landowner and one brother, brother is the priest. Uh, and I read it, and it was only two brief little scenes. Two brief little scenes? I am an actor. I was a, and that lasted for about 30 seconds. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I get down there, and he puts, you know, I'm down there for eight weeks. He said, I'm going to put you in this scene and that scene and that. So sometimes that does help. It doesn't always work. You can't expect anything. Uh, but it, it, it does help, I think, for you to do the thing that you know will help your career that your pride won't allow you to do. I will say one more thing about agents. When I was, had been here about three or four years working uh, and still doing a lot of theater, but beginning to get TV and film, I used to agonize over whether I should take another theater job because it wasn't really getting my agent very much money and very much clout and very much, you know, traction for my career. And uh, I remember I said to her one time, I, I don't know, Maggie, I feel like I feel like I, I, I owe you not to do theater for a while so I can pick up some, some television and film. I feel bad about this. And she said, Let, let's get one thing straight. She said, I work for you. I help you do what you want to do. If your agent never tells you that, get another agent. I, I have had experiences that have been talked about this evening in this regard as far as agents are, uh, go. I have no one in my family that was in the business. I, you know, I, I did this on my own. You know, it was kind of ordained. It was in the stars 5,000 years ago. My name was etched in them, you know. Um, and, and I had a few hard knocks. Um, I, like I said, I started musical theater. I was singing and dancing when I was four years old and went through school like that, and in all the school plays all the way through college, been doing it ever since, and will do it until the day they're throwing dirt in my face. Um, I lost a couple of agents early on because I was doing theater. And I was so dumb and naive uh, that my feelings were hurt. I cried for about 10 minutes both times, and then I quickly tried to find another agent, you know, because it was about, you know, I was building up this thick skin because God knows you got to have one. Uh, you'll probably hear no more than you hear yes, but isn't it amazing how that one yes can kind of make you forget those no's, you know? <laughs> and, and what that does is it helps to build that skin because there are so many elements in this business that don't have anything at all to do with you as a person or as a performer. You know, you may have parted your hair on the wrong side that day, you know? It, it has nothing to do with your capabilities. 
uh, but I got knocked around. I was doing a lot of theater, and I had landed a national tour. And who's going to say no to that? I mean, and this was when they were still doing A tours. I got to travel with two wardrobe steamers that they didn't mind shipping. I got on the plane in one city. The company manager would get everybody together. You get to the airport with your purse, and you get on the plane. And when you land in the next city, both my wardrobe steamers were in my hotel room. Who could ask for anything more? <laughs> Nobody travels like that anymore, you know. But um, um, I, while I was having a great time, and even the agent was getting their little 10%. Now, you know, this was an A tour, so I was making decent money. They got their, they got their money, but they just didn't like the idea that I was out of town for 12 weeks at a time. And so they dumped me. And I was working, and they dumped me. But they were, they were the Hollywood agent, and I didn't know about these people then. I know about them now, <laughs> you know. So I, I got dumped by a couple of those, and I was fortunate enough to land the agent that I'm with now, and that's the agent that we were talking about earlier that has respect for theater. To the point where the other evening at the Ovation Award, uh, it's toward the end of the ceremony, and you know we decide we're going to go and, and, and go to the ladies' room and fix our hair and makeup before the crowds hit. And as I'm going up the aisle, I hear, oh, Peggy, Peggy, hey, Peggy. And I'm turning, and I look, and it's Jeremy Luna, who is now the new theatrical agent, live theater agent at Hervey Grimes, which is the agency that represents me. So that consciousness has expanded to a point that I'm just absolutely delighted. I mean, they've done voiceover agents. They got this kind of agent, the commercial agent, the voiceover. And now they have a live theater agent. And this young man is something incredible. So, you know, along the way, even though I don't have anybody in the family in the business, somebody's looking out for me because it seems like every time I get tossed, I land on my feet. And there's somebody doing something wonderful waiting for me there. That's great. Um, and I'm loving all the Ovation Award shout outs. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Dick, and you talked a little bit with the video games and books on tape and kind of shifts in the industry. What shifts have you seen uh, other than those? Kind of, you know, you've had fantastic careers, but the, the business has been shifting with self-produced digital content and, and certainly your, your theater work, but more on the, the Hollywood industrial complex side of things. How, how have you seen the business change? Well, a big thing is uh, when I first came in that, to L.A., there was a lot of hour-long in L.A. That hardly exists, except for the legacy shows, you know, the shows that have been going on for a long time. Uh, there were so, also yeah, movies of the week. Movies of the week. Right, right. My God. You know, but, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've worked a lot in the last two years, and I have not worked in L.A. I've worked, everything's been in Vancouver. Everything. Mm -hmm. Now, I love Vancouver. I have wonderful friends. There's nothing, there's nothing I dislike about going to Vancouver, really except maybe not sleeping in my own bed every night. But what that means is that they're only, only going to fly you up to play a guest star. So those day guest spots, all of those things, uh, uh, many times, you know, if you have a recurring thing, the, if it were in L.A., they would include you, and you're in a script. They actually write you in the script, and when it comes down to money, they won't bring you up because it's going to be a top of the show. And that, I think, has really, really affected... Uh, the climate, the work climate in Los Angeles, you know, I mean, um, it, but it's a reality. It's the tax incentives, et cetera. I think the biggest shift that I realized happened about 10 or 11 years ago when two things occurred, reality television mm -hmm. and the incredible youth movement, the sudden shift of all the shows to much younger people. And I thought, okay, I've had a good run. I've been, I've had a good 10 year run. Um, it's going to be dicey for a few years. I'll get to do some theater. Won't make much money in film and television. And in about two or three years from now, they'll exhaust all the young storylines, and they'll all have to have parents and grandparents. <laughs> so I'll be fine in about three years. And by the time that happened, and they started casting the parents and grandparents, they were casting Lou Asner and George Siegel, and everybody who had had, had series of their own. They were, they were hiring major stars for the same amount of money that I would have worked for. So that little dream I had of suddenly becoming everybody's father in television sort of petered out quite a bit. That was one of the biggest changes that I noticed and it allowed me or actually gave me permission because I had had a good 10 or 11 years to actually focus a lot more on theater. 
than I had before. The second big shift I noticed is not as industry shift, it's my shift. I, I suddenly feel like my whole new career is opening for me because although Ed Asner and George Siegel are still taking my roles, I'm a 73-year-old who can remember his lines. <laughs> so, so I can go back on the stage and compete on an on a uneven playing field now <laughs> with some of these old guys who actually can't get through the show anymore. So for me, this is kind of a golden age in many ways. As long as I can keep holding on to those lines, my theater career is actually blossoming more than it did you know, 40 years ago. It's, can I say one thing? Uh, because that's very important. Uh, you need to look in the mirror and see who you are. You know, there are some people that they need to be in L.A. at a certain time. That this is when they need to be L.A. And, and you know, do theater, obviously, do, but this, this, these are their prime years. This is when they make sense. You know, we've all seen uh, um, a very, very youthful person who's been a star, and when they're 50, they're still, but they don't make sense at that age. You know what I mean? And similar things with guys. I mean, I, I wasn't compelled to come to L.A. in a similar thing because I was a character guy, and I, I didn't, you know, and I, I asked my agent one time when I got, the, a new agent, and this is sort of a funny thing. I said, uh, okay, so what do you need me to do? How can I help make your job easier? And he looked at me, looked at me, and he said, get older. <laughs> get older, you know? <laughs> and oddly enough, it, it's, there's a strange truth to that, you know? It's, you know, uh, I don't know. I'd love to hear, either the ladies ever get that note? <laughs> not about getting older. We're no. not going there. <laughs> Also, everything I've said in terms of advice, if you're young and gorgeous, pay no attention. <laughs> I, have, I have nothing to say to you if you're young and gorgeous. Don't follow my career. I was never my career path. And uh, your looks and your youth will put you in a completely different ca casting category from any other actors around. For either of you, uh, changes you've seen in the industry? Let me ask you a question. Do you think, in the years that you've been here, that Hollywood is swinging back, TV and film is swinging back more to, for mature female roles than, say, seven or eight years ago? Or is it still just as awful as it was seven or eight years ago? They've, I've seen stories the last couple of years that Hollywood is now looking much more to... Yes, they you know, are hiring more and more 35, 36-year-old women. They are. 37 sometimes. <laughs> So yes, the pendulum is swinging towards well, if they the mature play woman. <laughs> no, I mean, there are some, I mean, I, I don't know. There are some, some, you know, we all see it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I really don't. I will say about reality TV, I, I, I got a part on a, a reality program <laughs> once. I played a fake mom on The Bachelor. It was one of my funnest things I ever did. It was an improv thing. I had to Reality improv. shows are fake? <laughs> 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 no, no, no. I was hired, you know, the, one of the girls hired... Supposedly she did. The producers chose, I'm, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Yes, one of the gals on the show, one of the contestants, uh, contestants, what are they called? Uh, you know, right. the, 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 the candidate for The Bachelor hired actors to portray her parents, and I did a Mrs. Robinson on him. It was, it was The Bachelor London Calling. Anyway, um, it was one of the funnest things I ever had to do. One of the hardest gigs, Dakin, because I had to act with somebody who didn't know I was acting with him, and I had a storyline to, to actualize, and he didn't know that he had to actualize, actualize that storyline that I was playing. It was That's quite great. a challenge. Uh, Reality television. Let me re that, bring, that brings up another thing. The, 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 the thing that also shifted some years ago was that if you're an improv or stand-up, you're much more likely to get yourself a television show than if you're an actor. Oh, right. That shifted about 15 years yeah. ago, because yeah. if you do improv yeah. and stand-up, you're also saving the writers an enormous amount of time and, right. and, and energy. Even blue and I never did either of those, so. What was that? No, I said even blue comedians were, were getting their own uh, yeah. show. The edgier comedians were... Uh, were <laughs> oh, God, I got a story, but I can't even tell it in this <laughs> one. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. This is, <laughs> this is streaming. <laughs> we're streaming video. We are, we are streaming. I know, we're you'll streaming, protect, so I have to be very careful. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the show or the star. Uh, of course, that's the juiciest part of the whole thing. Uh, but it was a blue comedian, and uh, I was cast, it was occurring. That's the show I was telling you I threw up because it was, it was network and uh, it was on. Uh, they, 
I don't know why the producers did this, but because there was a live audience, and we're talking kids, you know, families came. And this is a blue comedian, and she, she was very nervous, very nervous. And cameras were rolling in her first show that afternoon, because it was two audiences, one in the afternoon, one later on in the evening. And the first show, she was very stiff in front of the camera, so they were like, oh my God, you know, we gotta you know, reshoot tonight. We gotta do something to loosen her up. So, producer who discovered her said, let's let her do her thing. You know, she's great in front of an audience, you know, telling jokes and what, you do not give a microphone to a blue comedian in a family with an audience. <laughs> she told a joke that, I, I'm not gonna repeat it here, but it was hilarious. Now, the hilarious part of the joke was the disbelief on the faces of the production staff as she started rolling. I mean, cause she got, she got in her rhythm. She got in her rhythm. And she was, she was cranking it, right? And it was, it was a story set up for this joke. And the language she was using throughout this joke, people were like, <laughs> the makeup lady was doing my makeup. She had to redo my makeup because the girl was hitting the, you know, the F word here and the M word there and, you know, the I'm, she, I'm just like, <laughs> and then he said, you know, and then the make, I'm like, you're going to put my eye out. People are <laughs> laughing and producer had a vein sitting on his head. <laughs> By the time she delivered the punchline, scripts just went up in the air. It was like, okay, it's over, it's over. But the, the show lasted one season. <laughs> <laughs> Such is my luck, right, right? But you're absolutely right about that. Comedians took over. And, um, and, I all, and, and all through that period, I, I kept feeling like, God, I just missed that one. Because uh, I went through the process that a lot of actors went through, uh, and, and you hit on it. You build up momentum with television out here, and, and this is the way it was going for me. I was building up momentum. I went from, you know, just breaking in to little co-stars. Next thing you know, I'm guest starring. Now I'm being looked at as time goes on for recurring. Well, it seemed like the natural groove was you get to recurring, and next thing you know, oh, my God, I can actually, it's possible to have my own show. And then here comes Felicia Rashad. You know, and everything I thought I was going to get, you know, it's somebody else. It's somebody else who already had a name. And that was my biggest bone with, uh, with, with the industry out here, is you work your tail off and you're getting the recognition. You're making, you're making the progress. And in my eyes, it was supposed to be the natural order of things. Well, it wasn't. But then, that's the important thing about what we do. You got to do it for the love. You cannot do it for the expectation. Because if you do it for the expectation, you will drive yourself nuts and you get on that hamster wheel of, oh my God, I have to do this by the time I'm this age and I got to do this by the time I'm that age. And what you'll wind up doing is driving yourself crazy and going home. So don't do that. Don't worry about the expectation. Just enjoy the journey. And sometimes when you do things out of love, there are little miracles that come out of them. I did a play. I did The Cherry Orchard at the Odyssey. Um, Alfred Molina was in it. And Rob Reiner came to see the play. And he cast me in his next film, Alex and Emma, as a result of seeing me in The Cherry Orchard by Chekhov. I want to stay a little bit in, the, in those dark periods. So, so in the slow times of your careers, um, and this is a question from the audience, did you ever want to quit? And what was it that kept you going? How did you persevere? How did you kind of get through that, that dark patch? Well, you know, or I, patches? I never wanted to quit acting necessarily, I, but I did want to to retreat to the theater, to go back where I felt completely used and valued. And, uh, but, um, you know, it's funny, my wife reminds me, I still have this dream that, okay, you know, when things, I'm going to go back and, you know, and just do theater full time. And she says, you know, that, that'll be great. And if you want to do that, that's wonderful. But what you're trying to go back to is your youth. You're trying to go back to what you remember, the, the camaraderie. It's all going to be different, as you said earlier, because now, I'm the oldest guy in the room, or the second oldest guy in the room, and it's a different, it's a different role. And, and if you accept that role, it's wonderful. I mean, there's nothing like, uh, you know, it, it, being in a play where you feel you're in the right part age-wise and all of those things. Uh, my difficulty is how do you, how do you, um, what do you do when your passion becomes your profession? When all of a sudden you know, the stuff that you just used to get up for, and just, you know, it would, it, it, you'd wake up in the morning with a, with a bounce, to, with an idea, or you were we, all waking up at night maybe with an idea and a little, little thing, I gotta write that down, I mean, that kind, and all of a sudden now, you know, you're being well paid, 
and you think, but you're just sort of slightly bored. How do you, how do you negotiate that? And that that's also so you don't get jaded and you don't. Uh, you do it with a sense of humor, I think, and to see the bigger picture. There's a funny thing. This sort of uh, it's sort of a humbling story, but I I, I love this story. <laughs> I was finishing uh, a film, and uh, it was on for four months, right? And uh, and but now we're two weeks away. What am I going to do? What am I going to you know? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I go back to my hotel room, and there's a script, and it says, "Dear Tony." Very interested in you for this part. Have contacted your agent. Give us a yes and no ASAP. This is how it works. You're in a big film, right? You're in a film. This, they, there must be a list somewhere that they get your name. And this is because it's a mystery, right? So I read. I open it up, and there's a, a scene with my character. It's a good scene. I'm in already, but I, you know, I'm going to. So I, another good scene. Oh, okay. This is sort of interesting. It's good. A third well, by the fourth scene, I'm suspicious. I'm suspicious. It, ain't this. it doesn't work this way. And I keep reading, and it's a bigger and a bigger, bigger part. Well, they had delivered the script to the wrong Tony. The Tony was Tony Hopkins. The script was Meet Joe Black. True story. True story. So, you know, you, it, it, was, it was delicious. There's a, certain, there's a certain deliciousness to that that I still uh, love. It's like being fired for the first time. You know, your agent calls and said, I got the good news and the bad news. Okay, give me the good news first. They're going to pay you. <laughs> That's the good news, the bad news. But you don't care. You know, you're, you know, it's a long journey. It's a marathon. But, uh, and, and you're going to hit low patches. And that's when the community of the theater... Group. It doesn't have to be a theater group. It could be anything. It could be of people making uh, films, digital films. It doesn't necessarily have to be the theater. Uh, that's when it becomes really, really important because there's something very isolating about the acting that we do in film and television. Uh, this is a family right here, right? Uh, you know, I'm an uncle. Here's a dad, two daughters, right? We've never, met, we've never met each other. And now we're into this, we're shooting this great drama. We've never met each other. We've all worked on the role individually but we've never probably more than likely have not rehearsed. So the, and that leads you to the sense that so much of film and television preparation is done alone. So and that's why communal stuff is very, very important. It'll lift you up, I think. Navigating through slow periods? I, I never wanted to quit. Uh, I never wanted to get into this profession in the first place. So. <laughs> Um, but uh, when, in the down times, you just uh, stay creative, I find. Catch up on your reading. Yeah. Write. I think most actors would be surprised to find that they actually write very well. Especially if you've done a lot of theater acting. You've got those great words been rolling around your head for 20, 25 years. You'd be surprised how well you, un you understand story structure and dialogue. You'd be very surprised. And, and narrative. So I say, you know, write, start writing, even if nothing comes of it. Do something creative all the time. Keep your, keep your juices flowing. Well, I did quit for a, a few years, the, prof the profession. I didn't quit acting, but um, in 2002, I finally um, got mounted, a, a, a small company mounted my solo play, and um, it was very well received. I got an ovation nomination, but I didn't win the award. And then two years later, um, it was remounted in a larger theater, and I won the Ovation Award for solo performance, which they don't give out anymore. And um, it was a peak. It was a peak moment, you know. And um, papers were writing about me, and I was, you know, and I was given a lot of um, attention. And it didn't translate into a new agent for television and film or into any remunerative, you know, work. And I was pretty much, that was it. I had devoted my life to, for like six years to that show. And I was like, you know what? I just, I just can't keep going. So I got my real estate license. It's not a joke, it's true. And I sold houses full time for six years. I also continued to act. I did a, a stint on Days of Our Lives for a few months and I got the occasional job. I didn't do much theater. And, um, and then I just uh, thought I was gonna kill myself was so unhappy. And so I, um, I extricated myself, knowing I was, you know, it was insanity. You're going to now, you're older, and now you're going to go back. This is insane, but I had to do it. And that was um, three and a half years ago, and I haven't stopped working since. 
And I think it's because I had, I had lived on the other side, really the other side, a profession, not just waitressing or um, you know, script reading or all the other things that I'd done in my youth to, to survive. I had really made a commitment to a real business profession. And I had, I had started out as a realtor, acting like a realtor, but I became a realtor. And really had to, you know, I was dealing with, it was like people's lives were in my hands. It was real, millions of dollars. It was so terrifying that I said to myself, I don't care how scared I am. I know the other fear, the fear of this world. It's, it's not brain surgery. And no matter what happens, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> and my feelings might get hurt. And I might not be rich, but it doesn't, it, I can handle this fear, this terror. That terror of the real world. So anyway, and like I said, I haven't stopped working since. I think it's because you make a commitment, you have a new vision, you take a break, you have new 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 life is breathed into you. You know, can I just say one thing? You know, in those down times where I could never find out what I would do if I wasn't. I mean, I, I didn't. It was one of those things, and it's just stupid luck. I was from the very beginning all in. From the from the very beginning, I just thought, I, of course, I would be an actor. Of course I would do, and everyone tried to talk me out of it, and rightfully so, and I just sort of ignored them. So consequently, when I finally, when I hit those low points, I, I, I really, I mean, I guess I could have gone and, 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 you know, into a university situation if I was lucky enough, uh, but that's it. I mean, I, ha I really have no skills, <laughs> you know, you know I, except, except that I probably can go into a job interview and convince people that I have skills. You know, but actual skills, not so much. You could be an artistic director. I could be an artistic. <laughs> no, I. There you go. <laughs> this is another uh, question from the audience. You talked a little bit about sort of being on the sitcom stage and how that was closest to theater. Uh, but can you talk about the process of actually producing comedy in theater and, and how that process has worked for, for any of you versus film and TV? So, comedic theater as opposed to comedic film or TV? I think the thing that, that Tony said is critical. It is, theater is the place where you control your timing and comedy is where you've got to have it perfect. So comedy is something that you really have to work on. Some people are, have, have com good comic instincts, clearly, and are naturally funny, and that you can't, you know, that you can't learn if you got that. But when you're performing comedy live in a play on stage, Rehearsal and precision and trust of the other actors is, is essential, essential, and that's most like a sitcom. Again, if you that's the only time you'll ever feel that way in doing film and television is in a in a well written sitcom. Hmm. And there are different sizes of comedy, and it's interesting that um, I mean there are different flavors of comedy. There's the dry comedy. There's witty comedy. There's uh, farce. There's, you know, which is why big, big comedy and, and um, you know what I mean? I think also if you can do comedy, you'll, you'll actually never be out of work. That's true. Mm -hmm. Especially if you can do all kinds of comedy. If you can make people laugh, mm -hmm. you pretty much have a better career than if you only make them cry. <laughs> it's true. And, and, and to what we were talking about, about the improv, um, which I did study improv with the Groundlings and with Chicago City Limits in New York. And all the young actors that I know today do study improv. And I think mm -hmm. that is fantastically valuable. It is invaluable. It's just like being shot out of a cannon. I, I strongly encourage everybody to, to take improv classes. Yeah, because when you, uh, actually when you show up on a set, it, it is sort of a little bit of an improv. You've had no rehearsal. So that, that freedom is really good. There's a, a wonderful actor, Michael McShane, who, uh, you know, we did a lot of theater with in the Bay Area, and then he went off to England, had a major career as an American actor. I'm, what was the name of the... Uh, Whose line is it, yeah, anyway? The, yeah, I mean, just amazing, you know. Uh, and he, then he came back into the theater, and he was a whole different person. I mean, he was whole... He really... I mean, you'd think, okay, you get your strength just from the theater, but he actually excelled at that and brought it back into the theater, and I thought... Uh, it's remarkable. You know, I, I'm, I don't consider myself very funny, so when I, I've done comedy, but I lean heavily on the play. So I lean heavily on, on the situation and thing of play because I'm not uh, particularly funny, but I, it, it is a unique, wonderful uh, sort of thing. So the sitcom experiences I've had are really sort of the unusual sitcom, the one I was fired from, 
although I, I cracked them all up at that run through that night, you wouldn't have known. They were laughing and hitting themselves. And the, but no, and uh, but but then I got to do you know Seinfeld. Did a couple of episodes Seinfeld uh, uh, and Titus. You know the I would do the odd sitcoms. You know just not. But I, I have to say I had a wonderful time doing them. And uh, yeah, actually one of the first things I saw I came. When I first was visiting in L.A., I came to see Dake in, in a taping of, uh, of My Two Dads. Was that My, my Two Dads? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I have great respect for them. I mean, you know. So. What's been your biggest surprise as an actor in your career? Your surprising anecdote or just overall? About oh, uh, yeah, I, about, tw about 15 years ago, after I founded the theater company, I decided that I would buy a building and build a theater for this theater company. And I thought, okay, now I'm going to be working with the, you know, with professional architects and contractors and subcontractors and you know, it won't be this sort of flaky life in the theater. It'll be, you know, the real people, the real business people. We're much better than they are. <laughs> I never worked with a group of people who couldn't get their work done on time, never knew, couldn't remember what we had told them the last time we ever had a meeting, lied to you constantly about what they were doing. That was the big awakening for me, that actually, stage actors particularly, are some of the most dependable artisans you will ever find. And I liked that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I think my biggest surprise was came very recently, um, and, and it came with the sitcom thing because it was a twist. Uh, all, all throughout uh, my television uh, appearances, all of my all of my sitcoms that I've done, Seinfeld, Murphy Brown, I mean, all, all, everything. I, I got I was fortunate. I got to hit almost all of them, and enjoyed each and every one of them. Got to do some funny stuff. Got to say some hilarious words, but the most recent surprise came doing Crash and Bernstein. And that was realizing the amazing chemistry I had with a Muppet. <laughs> Tim Legasse and I, now, and, and we introduced ourselves, to, you know, because all of my scenes are, are with Crash. I don't know if any of you have seen the show. It's a cute show. It's a kid's show. And that was another first. It was my first kid's show on television. Well, I did a couple of, you know, the tween things, but this was, you know, kids. And Tim Legasse, we merely introduced ourselves, but this guy is so good. We're doing a bit, and he's sitting on a couch next to me, and of course there's a hole in the couch. He's under the couch. That's an experience. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't acted until you had the, act, the actor under your butt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got Crash sitting next to me on the couch, and, you know, I'm interacting with this. And so he's an actor to me, so, and I'm loving this Muppet. I'm loving this Muppet. <laughs> And we had some great stuff to do together. And here comes a producer, and I'm hearing them because there's no live audience, there's no laughers. Producers are in the booth, and you're hearing this laughter from way far away. <laughs> and you're wondering, God, is that for us? You know, or is, is that somebody up the hall? No. But uh, 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 working with a Muppet was, because I've never done it before, and uh, the producers were just astounded at the chemistry between me and a Muppet, <laughs> which, which was just absolutely great, because Tim Legasse absolutely disappeared, and it was just kind of me and Crash. Yeah. Big surprise? Maybe that the older I get, the more I anticipate opportunity. That might sound insane, but I feel like opportunity is coming with each passing year. You know, for me, it's, it's actually being in this situation, you know, being asked to come here and ha because I've had a career. I mean, so the surprise was the fact you think, my God, wow. You know, I have, you know, I, I started acting professionally about 77, 78. Uh, and, and that's all I've ever done. I've either, I've taught at the university. I've, uh, uh, two jobs in between. Uh, you know, I, I was a phone solicitor uh, for um, Seattle Times in between jobs. And I worked as a waiter, you know, in New Haven in between seasons at Ashland. And that was it. And, uh, you know, it's just remarkable. Uh, to me. I mean, I, uh, I, I don't know uh, how to explain it. I mean, I never thought, you know, it would happen. And all of a sudden, you, know, you find yourself on a set and you look around and you think, oh, how did, 
you know, did they check my ID? I mean, you still have that doubt. And you know, that doubt's not a bad thing. That doubt is, if it gets you up in the morning, I mean, Anthony Quinn said that his, his fear is his friend because his fear is what makes him not take for granted. His fear is what makes him learn that audition. You know, and, uh, you know, and, and those things are sort of important. There's also a, another great uh, thing I have to say, just really, really quickly. There was, a, um, I heard this story that <laughs> Rex Harrison was on the road, you know, with a big thing, and, and a stage manager would, you know, and he was a complete professional all the time, except opening nights in different cities. And then he would come in late to half hour, he would, you know, there were proscenium stages, he would peek out and he would just swear at the, just, just mutter to himself. And the stage manager watched this, says, Rex, uh, we're running a little late, and he'd send him off. So finally the tour is coming to an end. And he said, I have to ask you this question. He said, you, you, you're like on top of it all the time, but every opening night in every city, yeah, I mean, you're a, a sensation like, what, what is the story? Uh, you know, and he says, oh, you don't understand, my dear boy. I have to go out there tonight and be as good as I never was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's something great, you know, something humbling that, you know, the doubt, even, you know, uh, having seen him on stage, it was such an ease, but th that even doubt can be your friend. Uh, you know, make that your friend and kind of make it give you energy because it's going to be there because if it's not there, then you're the asshole in the corner <laughs> who we all hate to work with, you know what I mean? So, Got a, a two for question. What's next? What's the next project you're working on? And is there a dream project? a dream role that you have yet to perform that you'd love to? Next for me is Rocky the Musical on Broadway. I'm playing the Burgess Meredith role. Sort of working my way through the great character actors of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to recreate their roles. Um, I do have a, I, do, I did when I, when I turned 65, I did make a bucket list of roles that I wanted to play before I ended my career. And uh, it was only six roles long, and I've done two of them. You know, like two weeks after I made, I never made such a list. People would always say, what's your favorite role? I never knew the answer to that question. What's the role you want, you, you're dying to play? I never knew the answer to that question. And then I decided, and I turned 65, that I would um, make this list up, and two weeks later, somebody called me and offered me one of the roles on that. And that was, I started going out of town then. I hadn't. I hadn't gone out of town on a job in 25 years, and this was in, in Dallas. Somebody called me and said, can you play Big Daddy? And I said, I'll be there. And I arrived, and they were just firing the Big Daddy. It was already two weeks into rehearsal. I thought, oh, God, that's kind of creepy. And the director said, oh, we're so glad you're, you're here. We don't have much time. We're glad you've done Big Daddy before. I said, I've never done Big Daddy before. <laughs> And I did another one, not, not long after that I got enough for another of them. So I'm looking forward to the, to the next four, but I don't know if I'll ever get there. What's the other one? A Prospero is one, Galileo is one. I'd like to do the Duke and Measure for Measure sometime. And I forget the other one, I'm getting old, what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> well for me next, I'm uh, getting ready to do uh, Villon. I'm uh, playing Clotilde in Villon, which is a Padua Playwrights uh, project. I've had a very interesting experience, if you don't mind me taking a second to talk about them for a minute. Um, th they have done a series, a play called The Gary Plays. And Murray Mednick has written these plays along with the other uh, Padua Playwrights over the course of a number of years. And we also shot a movie, a uh, feature film called Gary's Walk. Hopefully it'll be released next year. And the film was based, of course, on the plays, which I love film based on a play. I love it. Um, in this particular series, actors got to k keep their roles. And I have played, uh, in the Gary play series, I have played Antonio, this essence uh, that walks you over to the other side, uh, for like the last well, like seven or eight years, uh, playing the same character, which you don't get to do uh, in theater so much. Uh, you, you go from one show to another, but to play and, and, and have the opportunity to revisit the same role is quite extraordinary. So they're doing a little departure. Uh, there's only one more Gary play. There's eight plays in the Gary series. There's only one more left. Uh, they had scheduled to do the last Gary play, and for some reason they've decided to do the Villon play uh, instead. So those of you who may be familiar with the Gary play, you still have the eighth one to look forward to. But uh, And you know. so do you. And so do I. And so do I. But uh, look out for Villon. Um, it'll, I think we're going to be at the Odyssey, I'm not sure, but it'll be in the papers. And a dream role? 
<laughs> Is there a dream role? Or um, not yet? The lead in any film. <laughs> Fair enough. Gigi? I'm just preparing to direct An Ideal Husband by Oscar Wilde uh, at the Sierra Madre Playhouse, opening January 17th. And um, a web series called Kittens in a Cage is coming out soon. I play the prison matron. I have a hook for a hand. It's going to be really funny. It's directed by Gillian Arminante. It's a really broad, nasty humor, starring some fabulous people. And uh, my dream role is Martha in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, you know, probably in the theater, uh, um, uh, I'd like to do a Prospero very much, and I'd like to do a Lear, but not eight shows a week. I don't think I can do it eight shows a week. Um, at least the way, you know, with the kind, of, I, I wouldn't want to be that guarded, you know, which I don't think those roles are meant to be done eight times a week. Um, um, you know, I'd like to do a Willie Loman. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of Titus. It's also their, uh, um, ba, 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 ba. and then there's, uh, what is the other one? Anyway, those are some, but you know, in film and television, what I'd like to do is to be part of a production, a film, a television series that wouldn't be thought much of right now. And about 25 years from now, people would go, oh, that was, you know, that, that was the one. You know, one of those, sort of something that has legs and carries on, I, I, and something that's human. Something that's, uh, but I, I, I also have trouble trying to, you know, with my own casting sometimes. <laughs> Although, uh, you know, I, I did for the longest time think uh, that there was really not much for me in O'Neill. I liked O'Neill, but there wasn't much for me in there. It was an Irish experience and everything. And then finally I read Huey, and I just connected with him. I had I'd done it in a reading situation. A uh, really hot reading, a prepared reading. And now uh, we're going to start, that was a year ago, and we're going to start again this week and just do a reading of it uh, in Palm uh, Springs. Palm Springs, there's a theater there. And I'm hoping to find a home for it at some point. Um, and uh, so that's, so I do, it, none of that is paid, mind you. That's all future mining, but it doesn't make a difference. And, you know. Yeah. Please thank our panelists for sharing their stories.